All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google SEO Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a search advocate at Google. And part of what I do are these Office Hour Hangouts where people can jump in and ask their questions around search. A uh, bunch of things were submitted on YouTube already. Uh, so we can go through some of that. But maybe, first of all, I just wanted to wish you all Happy New Year. Uh, thanks for sticking around last year through all of the, I don't know, ups and downs and sideways and everything. Uh, hopefully, this year will be a little bit easier, but it's starting off with a bang, so we'll see. Uh, hopefully, at least with these office hour hangouts, we have something kind of regular that's not too too crazy. Anyway, and so. We, we can jump through some of the questions that were submitted. But maybe, first of all, if any of you want to ask a question, something on your mind, feel free to jump on in now. No one. Oh, I see. Someone raise a hand. Go for it. Um, hi, John. Uh, if you can hear me. OK, perfect. So I'm trying to index a site uh, that has about a million products. Uh, so I'm trying to index it you know, slowly uh, by just submitting the products first, and then categories, pages, rather indexing tags and everything or, you know, once. So this is being done from last few weeks. And I've managed to index about 3 lakh products. So is there something you know I can do extra to uh, expedite the process so I can you know get indexed those products quickly? Not really. So I, I assume this is a new website. Uh, yeah, it was actually published um, three four months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So usually what what happens on our side is we try to index a bunch of content from especially new websites. Uh, but we're a little bit trying to be on almost on the safe side uh, when it comes to a ton of content. Uh, so in particular, uh, it, it takes a lot of storage. It takes a lot of time to, to index really large websites. So we need to make sure that it's really worthwhile. Uh, so one of the things that we do is we might, in the beginning, with a new website, we might be a little bit more conservative and a little bit hold back a little bit on the indexing speed, on the crawling speed, so that we don't cause problems on the server. And over time, as we see that this is a really good website, that it's kind of embedded well within the rest of the web, and we'll pick up again and crawl a little bit more. Uh, so what you're seeing there is essentially normal and expected. And it's not that there is a, a simple way to just say, OK, Google, index a million pages. Uh, but rather, you have to kind of show to Google that actually the, the millions of pages that you have on your site, they're worthwhile. And they're important to the index because they contain something that people are looking for, uh, where people are actively going to your site, recommending it to other people. So, yeah. So, so that was really interested. Uh, I actually, um, yeah, uh, know this. Uh, you know the quality and the you know uh, of, uh, from your guidelines, etc. So this is actually a parts website. You know, uh, uh, mechanical parts. It has you know specific niche or industry that is you know searching for those parts. So I, I believe it might take. I mean, much longer than uh, the usual website. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, it. I don't know. It it depends. It, it's possible. Uh, so one one of the the strategies that some sites use, especially in the beginning as they're building things up, is to concentrate on fewer pages that are really important for you, and build up on those pages and expand from there. So with a parts website, one of the things you could do is focus, for example, on, on the categories of parts that you have. And uh, instead of focusing on all of the millions of individual parts on the categories, 
Because then people will still be able to find your categories if they search specifically for the part number or the, the name of the part. Uh, but you'll have a lot fewer pages that you want to have indexed in the beginning. And we can focus on that first. And then over time, you can say, oh, well, these parts are also good to be indexed, and these parts. So kind of controlling indexing a little bit to match what, what you actually want to have found. Perfect. Yeah, I got it. Thank you so much. Sure. It's, it's always a bit challenging with, with a new website and if you have a lot of content. And uh, especially if it's something where you'd say, well, it's, it's normal content. It's not that you're like, automatically generating content in the millions of pages. But uh, it, it takes time. And kind of learning to focus first and then expand from there, I think that really helps. Thanks. Can I ask the next one? Sure. Go for it. OK. Hello, John. So my question is regarding links report in Search Console. So as of now, we cannot see the, all the links. But uh, regarding some links which we are visible on the report, so are Google filtering uh, based on some ref um, uh, reference tag? Uh, i sorry. I forgot the actual name. The no oh, follow? Uh, yeah, the no follow sponsored or UGC and all. So, is Google shows all the links, all type of links, or Google filters some type of links or attribution? We can say. So, just wanted to know. Yeah, we we don't filter by by the type of links, which is sometimes a bit confusing. Um, but uh, what we do there is we show a sample of the total link. It's not that we would show all of them there. It's not that we would filter by no follow or by disavowed links or, or th things like that. It's really just the sample. And we, we try to make it a representative sample. Um, but uh, so sometimes you have a little bit more, and sometimes you have a little bit less. Thanks. Uh, John, I have follow up on this. Sure. Sure. So, uh, John, in case there is any site migration, on that case, can we expect immediately moving links from one uh, property to next property, or it will take time for Search Console to, to start showing links on new property? Because of, uh, we are noticing that uh, in some websites, links report it is not fetching for new property. Um. I, I think it would be normal that, that it takes a bit of time with, with a site migration to update all of the data in Search Console. I don't know if there's anything different with regards to the links reports there. Uh, but it's, it's pretty normal when you do a site migration that the, the data takes a bit of time. Uh, specifically with regards to links, what what happens there is we we track the link based on the canonical URLs on both ends. So on the one hand, the page that it's linking from, we take the canonical URL from there, and the canonical URL of the page that it's linking to. And if you do a site migration, then individually the pages on your website will ideally shift the canonical to your new site. And uh, then when that canonical shifts, then we count that link as being from the original source to the new canonical URL. Uh, so that's something where, theoretically, if we just don't do anything special for site migrations, then that's a process which will take a bit of time. On the one hand, for us to shift the, the canonical. On the other hand, for us to shift the data in, in the links report. So, I, I don't know if we do anything special for a site migration cases where you have the, uh, the setting in Search Console. Uh, but I would expect that this takes several months, maybe, to, to settle down to, to the new domain when you're doing a migration like that. And it's probably similar for, for the other reports. But especially with the links report, it's really something where we really have to focus on the canonicals on both ends. and that especially takes a little bit longer. 
so on that case uh, if new property is getting indexed then immediately the links from old property will be shifted or google needs to go and crawl those links again and then only it will map uh, canonical and then shift meaning uh, meaning it it will depend on links source uh, crawling or no. it will depend only Okay. No, it's it's based on the the destination. So it's is a little bit I don't know complicated in the sense that for for the links we we have those both ends like the the page it's linking from and the page that it's linking to, and if either of those changes the canonical, then we will update that in our internal links. Uh, but uh, especially with with the links report. There are like, so many steps that lead to the data being shown in the links report. I could imagine it just takes a little bit longer. OK. Thanks. Sure. One other question I just wanted to ask. OK. The lead. So um, suppose a website receive a manual action regarding unnatural links so how a webmaster or a website property owner will you know analyze those links okay because of those links i'm receiving the manual action because in manual action there is no example links are given so yeah. this is very hard uh, to a uh, webmaster to identify which links causing the manual action or yeah yeah so the i i, I think the the general theme is kind of like, well, if you don't show all of the links, how can I fix all of the links? And uh, our, in, in general, when it comes to manual actions, it's not something that is based on individual links. It's really based on a, a broader pattern. And uh, that's essentially the, the broader pattern that you should look for and try to resolve, and not it's like those individual five links there and five links here kind of thing. Uh, so for manual actions, in, I, I think in pretty much all cases, it would be the situation that in the links report, you see enough information to recognize that broader trend of a, of a problem. And based on that, you can fix that broader problem. And the, the manual actions team is, for, for the most part, not going to be picky in that, oh, you fixed 700 links, but you didn't fix these two links. Uh, but rather, they want to see that you understood what the problem was and that you were able to resolve that. Uh, so that's kind of the, the general idea there. And for that, you don't need to have all of the links. You need to kind of know what the problem is. And most of the time, you will kind of know what, what you or what your site did uh, to, to get that manual action. And then fixing that is something that needs to be done. One of the things, especially I think with the, the links-based manual actions, is it takes a lot of manual work on our side also to review those. Uh, so sometimes they just take a little bit longer to be reviewed, which means from, from a practical point of view, it makes sense to really go through and uh, try to clean up as much of, as possible uh, with regards to those links. So, uh, that's something where if you do have a manual action based on links, then finding the broader pattern is really important, but also really being clear that you recognize it and cleaned it up is, is really important. Uh, again, as you said, the broader pattern. So recently, in a couple of months, we saw um, links are coming from Google websites itself. Uh, for example, hotel uh, websites, Google hotels. So. From Google hotel website, we are getting around hundreds of thousands of links for a specific single page without no follow, and the anchor text is remain the same. So will this cause or maybe the reason for the manual action? Or No, no that, nope. that should not be the case. Uh, if, if it's a no follow link, definitely not. Um, if it's something which is, is a natural link that, that is there, then also definitely not. It's really more a matter of, Maybe you reached out to 1,000 bloggers and tried to get a link from their site. Or maybe there, there's some other pattern involved where you're, you're paying people for links or you're doing some kind of a link exchange kind of scheme. Then that's, that's the kind of thing where the, the web sham team would, would step in and say, OK, we, we need to take manual action here. For nofollow links, 
we, we can ignore those automatically. That's perfectly fine. Uh, just because it's a large number of links, that doesn't matter. If it's a similar anchor text, that doesn't matter. It's really the, the thought behind the links that's, that's important for us. OK. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, John, John, regarding yeah. uh, no follow, uh, we all know that uh, they, they don't need to be disavowed. But what about UGC and sponsored links? You also don't need to disavow those. Okay. Also, okay. the links which are tagged as reference. Which, which one do you mean? A reference. Referrals. Like, yes. How, how do you mean? I don't know. The links. Uh, are referral, is, I, referral is probably, I think, uh, uh, Google Chrome's attribute, which is ignored by Google uh, uh, Google Crawler. Yeah. This is what what I know about. So Google uh, yeah. Google crawler ignores referral link. That is also equivalent to a do follow link. Yeah, and those links are visible in the links report. Yeah. So, so do we need to disavow those links or not? No, I mean, I mean, if they're they're flagged as such that they wouldn't be passing page rank, like uh, with a no follow UGC sponsored, then that's that's perfectly fine. You don't need to disavow those. And and John, that that stuff's still really only worth doing with a manual penalty and not just as a general tidy up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the one yeah. the one case I I might do that outside of a manual penalty is if you really know that someone working on your website did something weird in that direction. And you just want to make sure that it doesn't end up in a manual action. But for like normal websites on a day to day basis, you don't need to do anything with the disavow report. Uh, uh, John, John, regarding this, I, I had one idea. So, uh, when Google already discounts those links when manual action happens, and we have seen a lot of times uh, webmasters disavow other types of links which are not worth to be disavowed. And you you also suggested that it is not the web web spam team hundred percent expects uh, uh, things to be disavowed. Then why Google wants uh, uh, webmasters to to disavow those links, or 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 do some exercise because Google is already just discounting those links, and the chances are sometimes webmaster make more damage on the website. Yeah, I I think it's at some point we'll get into the position that we can really completely handle this. But it's on on the one hand, it's it's a way for for people to clean things up if they they are aware of issues, and uh, the the other part that I I think always comes up a little bit when it comes to links is the the general fear that a competitor might be harming your website. And uh, that's something where I, I think we do a really good job of recognizing those situations and ignoring them. Uh, but I know it's easy to lose sleep over something like that because it feels like something that you have no control over. And uh, by using the disavow links report, that's something where if you do recognize something where a competitor is doing something really weird uh, with regards to links to your website, then you can go in there and say, OK, I just want to be 100% sure that this is not something that Google will ever consider as something that I'm doing. Uh, so that kind of that peace of mind aspect, I think, is also quite, quite useful there. But uh, I, I think it would be nice at some point to be able to move away from just like, focusing on links so much, but uh, probably not, not soon. Hmm. Also, the other option is to just not allow users to to do it. In which case, they're screwed permanently. Yeah, I. You're asking Google to do more work to save you work, which for the most part you don't need to do if you haven't done anything wrong anyway. So it's it's self policing yeah. in a lot of ways, other than genuine, you know, attacks on other sites. But they're few and far between the genuine ones. The, the, or I should be more specific, the genuine ones that work 
I mean, it goes on all the time. Our, our site's got a ton of junk links coming into it, but we didn't build them, so we just ignore them. But genuinely malicious, effective, negative SEO attacks are, I mean, you just can't find them. Mm. I don't work for Google, by the way. Okay, I'm going now. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Okay. Let, let me run through some of the submitted questions, and uh, we'll, we'll probably have more time for other things that come up o over the course as well. Um, I have five brands that each cover different non-overlapping territories, but all brands offer the same service. I have a website for each brand. The content for each website is the same other than that uh, the territory that's covered. What's the best approach for SEO for website content so that one brand doesn't penalize the other brand with duplicate content? Uh, is it to write different content for each site or to use JSON LD to tell Google the target territory for the content or something else? Uh, so it sounds like the content is in the same language, which is, is something that I think would make it very different, because if the content were just translated into different languages, then it would be unique content. We wouldn't have to worry about uh, duplicate content. Uh, so that's that's one, one part that sometimes comes up. But it sounds like maybe in this case, everything is in English and for different countries that, that speak English, for example. Uh, one thing you can do here is use the hreflang attribute to tell us about these different versions and say, this is the English version for the UK. This is the English version for the US, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that helps us. Uh, what happens there with the hreflang is that we will index these different versions in most cases. And when a user searches, we'll try to show the version that is most suited to their location. Uh, so that's, that's one approach that you could do there. Uh, the other approach is, like you mentioned, making sure that the content is slightly different. Uh, a, a third approach might also be to say, well, if this content is really the same everywhere, then maybe it makes sense to concentrate it into one site. Uh, usually, I recommend folk trying to reduce the amount of content and focusing on fewer versions rather than more versions, uh, just because it makes that kind of that single version, if you have a single version, much stronger. In that uh, we can understand that all of the value of your site is concentrated there, and when someone searches for something general, we can say, well, this is a really strong and good website for this topic. We can show this one. Uh, sometimes that's not feasible when you're targeting different countries or different territories, uh, sometimes for policy reasons or, I don't know, so, some other reasons. So if you need to have different versions, then you kind of have those options of making different content or using hreflang attributes. Uh, the other thing maybe worth mentioning here is that there is no penalty for duplicate content. It's not that we will say your website is lower quality or uh, spammy or problematic if you have the same content across different websites for, for different audiences. Uh, what happens on a practical level is if it's exactly the same page, then we might just index one version of that page. And uh, we'll try to concentrate the value there, because we think it's like exactly the same thing. So we put it all into one page. Uh, what can also happen if a part of the page is the same is we'll index the individual versions. And if someone is searching for something that is within this chunk of text that is shared across these pages, we'll just pick one of those pages to show in the search results, and we'll kind of filter out the other ones. And usually, we'll try to pick the one that best matches what the user is looking for. But uh, sometimes that's kind of tricky if we don't have enough information about like, wh what exactly the user is looking for. Uh, so those are kind of the, the different approaches there. And I, I think there are pros and cons to, to all of those approaches. So it's not that there is one solution that will always work if you have five brands and you want to keep them kind of separate. But uh, different, different approaches might make sense uh, in your particular case. Uh, my website is an e-commerce site, and my website's index pages have been declining. What can I do to increase my website's index number? Uh, so I think we talked about this 
in the beginning slightly as well uh, with regards to the site that had millions of pages and uh, is just getting started. Uh, in particular, when it comes to indexing, we don't guarantee that we will index all pages of the website. And especially for larger websites, it's really normal that we don't index everything. And that can be the case that maybe we just index one-tenth of a website because it's a really large website. And we don't really know if it's worthwhile to index the rest. Uh, sometimes we index 90%. And you kind of struggle with those remaining 10%. Uh, but uh, that kind of that balance between trying to index as much as possible and trying to focus on the content that we think is actually going to be shown in search, uh, that's, that's something we, we always have to struggle with. Uh, so usually, the approach that I recommend is kind of twofold. And we talked about this in the beginning as well. On the one hand, uh, trying to reduce the number of pages that you want to have indexed so that you can focus a little bit more on fewer pages and making those stronger. That's, that's one approach that I think makes sense and is, depending on the website, kind of possible. Um, the other approach is to really significantly work to improve the quality of your website overall and to make it so that Google and users and everyone understands that this is a really important website, and it would be a, a flaw in Google's algorithm if Google's algorithms decided not to index as much as possible from this website. Uh, so that's kind of the, the other approach there. Uh, Usually, it's a little bit easier to focus on fewer pages and just making those stronger than to significantly improve the quality of a whole website overall, especially when you're talking about a really large e-commerce website. Uh, but some, sometimes it's worthwhile to take that time to invest and try to significantly step things up. Um, share some brief information on SSR and CSR and how it impacts indexing and ranking. So SSR is server-side rendering, and CSR is client-side rendering. Uh, so usually those are the aspects of um, kind of like how, how you're using JavaScript on a website uh, with regards to showing the content uh, on your website. And uh, the general approach there is if you have a JavaScript-based website, if you don't do anything special, then that would be called client-side rendering, because in your browser, it has to process the JavaScript and then render the pages. Uh, whereas if you do something special on your website with that JavaScript-based uh, website, uh, so that the server actually processes the JavaScript and then sends the, the HTML code to the, the browser, then that would be called server-side rendering. And there are pros and cons to both of those approaches. Sometimes there, there's a speed aspect involved there as well, and that server-side rendering takes a bit of time, uh, but it makes things a little bit faster for users, so you kind of have to balance things out there. Uh, I would recommend checking in with uh, Martin. Uh, Martin also does office hours for SEO, uh, for JavaScript SEO in particular. And uh, trying to, to ask him, I guess, questions more specific to what exactly you're looking for. Uh, because this is a really broad topic, and I don't think there's like this one thing where it's like, oh, you should do exactly this, and it will work well. Uh, but rather, usually, you're, you have some existing framework on your website that's based on JavaScript, and you need to figure out what you need to do then. Uh, so I check in with Martin on that. Um, how do AMP pages help in ranking? Uh, also, how, how does it make sense when we have a PWA uh, client-side rendered uh, light, quick loading pages, and we also make AMP for the same pages? Uh, so AMP pages do not affect ranking. Uh, that's kind of the first thing, uh, for, first off. Uh, so it's not that you need to use AMP if you want to rank well in search. Uh, there, I, I believe there are still some features that rely on the AMP framework with regards to how we show the content. Uh, there's also Web Stories, which is based on AMP. Uh, so if you want to use anything around that, then maybe it makes sense to use AMP. Uh, but if you're just worried about speed, 
AMP is a great way to make really fast websites, but it's not the only way to make really fast websites. So uh, that's something where if you do have a really fast website already, then maybe that's, that's already fine. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to talk you out of using AMP, because I think it's, it's fantastic to have a framework that makes it easy to make really fast websites. Uh, but at the same time, you don't need to kind of like turn everything around. And if you have a really fast website already, then change your framework and change all of that just so that you can use it. Um, regarding the upcoming mobile-first indexing update, if content is similar and crawlable for Googlebot from mobile and desktop, but the mobile version is not responsive, then how can this update uh, affect those websites? I see several blogs claim that responsive web design is a first step for this, but I don't see any information from the Webmaster Central blog for this claim. Um, yeah. So, I'm not 100% not sure what, what exactly you're asking here. Uh, but uh, if, if you have a separate mobile and a de separate desktop version, and you have those versions linked properly so that we can understand the connection between those two, uh, then that's essentially what, what we need so that we can understand that those versions are there. Uh, when it comes to mobile-first indexing, we will only index the content from the mobile version, though. Uh, so that's something where if, li like you said there, the content is similar and crawlable for mobile and desktop, then that's kind of what we would focus on. And uh, we would use the desktop version as a way of understanding, oh, there's a desktop URL for this page as well. And if someone on desktop is searching, we can show them the, the desktop URL. Uh, but otherwise, we'll focus indexing on the, the mobile version. And it's not the case that the mobile version has to be responsive design. Um, if you have separate mobile URLs, that's, that's perfectly fine. I, I don't think it's the, the optimal approach to have a mo separate mobile URLs. But if that's the way your website is set up, then if the mobile URL has all of the content, then that's, that's essentially OK. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, so my question is about uh, targeting different region in a country. So one of my clients, they have they provide same service, but for each state they have different brand name, and they have different website, uh, separate website for each brand. Now they want to use uh, same content on each website. Do you think this will uh, this will be a problem from duplicate content issue? And if we have this issue, then how we can uh, rectify this problem? I, I think we just went through that question briefly right before you joined. Uh, so I had, I'd check out the recording afterwards and uh, see, see if that answers your question, uh, because that's is pretty much exactly the same, same question there, like the, the same content for, for different brands kind of thing. OK. Sure. Uh, Pratik, I, I think you had some some more details on on the question there. Do you do you have a microphone that maybe you can ask there? Uh, John, I think he is talking more about viewport. Is it really required to have responsive page if the content is similar in mobile and desktop version? Okay, so. The, the viewport meta tag, I think, is, is specific more to the uh, responsive design setup. Uh, so that's something where if you have a separate mobile URL and a separate desktop URL, that's perfectly fine. Uh, for indexing, we focus on the content of the page. We don't see if it's mobile friendly. We essentially just use a mobile version for indexing. Uh, mobile friendly is something that we use uh, for the, the page experience ranking factor, which is coming in May. Uh, so it makes sense to, to have a mobile friendly page. But if you have a mobile version and a desktop version, and the mobile version is mobile friendly, then that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, how would you remove date snippets appearing in the search results for static pages like home, services, contact, et cetera? Um, so we, 
we don't have a meta tag to remove dates in, in particular uh, from, from pages that we show in the search results. Usually, we try to understand when it makes sense to show a date on a page, and we'll try to show that in, in the snippet of the search results itself. If there's a specific date that you want to have shown, then you can use the, I think, the, the date structured data in the article structured data type, I think, uh, where you can tell us which, which date we should use there. So if you do have a date, we can tell us there. If you don't tell us there, then we'll look at the content itself to try to find a date within that. Uh, if you don't want a date to be shown, then it's not possible to suppress that date snippet from being shown. Uh, but uh, what you could do is, of course, make sure that there's no date shown on your page. So if you don't have any dates in the HTML page, then that we don't really have much to pick up on to, to show there. So especially when you're talking about things like a home homepage or a contact page, then for the most part, you probably don't have dates on there anyway. So that should be something where you shouldn't see that too frequently. If you do see this showing up on pages where you'd say, well, it's a normal contact us page. Why is Google ever showing any dates there? Then I would love to have examples of that. So in particular, a, a query where you're seeing that happen and the URLs uh, from your site where that's happening from. Uh, so that, that's something that we can take up with, with the team here uh, that works on showing dates and recognizing dates on a page uh, where we can say, well, Maybe we're recognizing a phone number as a date accidentally, and uh, we need to be able to fix that. Uh, after the disavow tool is used, does a domain carry any mark that it may hold it back? Uh, no, no. The disavow tool is purely a, a technical thing, essentially, that tells our systems to ignore these links. It's not an admission of guilt or any kind of bad thing to use a disavow tool. Uh, it's not the case that we would say, well, they're using the disavow tool. Therefore, they must be buying links. Uh, it's really just a, a way to say, well, I don't want these links to be taken into account. And sometimes that's for things that you have done or someone working on your website has done in the past. Uh, sometimes that's for things that you just don't want Google to take into account for whatever reason. And uh, both of those things are, are good situations, right? It's like you recognize there's a problem, and this is a tool that you can use to resolve that. And uh, that's, that's not a bad thing. So it's not the case that there's any kind of a red mark or any um, kind of flag that's passed on just because a website has used the disavow tool. Uh, how can a bad SEO practice rank first and a good SEO practice website rank second and third when the implementation of the new Google updates hits big sites or it's never going to happen? Um, I, I think this, this is something that comes up pretty much all the time. It's uh, like I'm, I'm ranking below a website, and they're doing one thing bad. And why doesn't Google notice that and just remove that website completely from search? Because they're keyword stuffing, or they, they've bought links, or they've done some, some other crazy thing. And uh, I, I don't think that this is something that is, for, for the most part, useful to focus on as a site owner. Uh, because essentially, you're focusing on someone else's website and trying to find problems in that other website rather than taking the time that you have and focusing on your website instead. Uh, so that's kind of the, the first, first approach that I have there. The other thing is that our algorithms use so many different factors when it comes to ranking uh, that it's, it's very common that a website does not do everything perfectly. I think that's, that's like the, the most common situation overall, in that a website will do some things really well and some things kind of OK, and maybe will do some things really badly. And because of that, it's not the case that we would say, well, we'll just remove all of the websites that aren't perfect, because then I think the search results will be pretty empty. 
Uh, and instead, our algorithms are built in a way to try to find the, the overall view of that website. So that could be simplified into, well, we take the average of how good the website is. It could also be that for some things, we can recognize that a website is doing something badly, and we try to ignore that. And I think that ignoring option is really important and really a, a strong part of our algorithms, because that means that even if you follow bad advice from the internet somewhere, it's not that your website will automatically be discarded and never shown in search. Uh, but rather, like we recognize, oh, you're using keyword stuffing on your pages, and we can just ignore that keyword stuffing, and we'll focus on the good parts of your pages. Uh, so if you get weird advice from friends or from the internet about your website, and you follow that advice, uh, and we can recognize that yeah, you're trying to do something sneaky there, then we'll try to ignore that and instead focus on the good parts of your website. Uh, so that's kind of a good thing for your situation. But obviously, if your competitor is doing something wrong and we're just ignoring that bad part, then that can be a bit frustrating. So instead of focusing on the things that your competitor is doing wrong, try to find ways that you can improve your website uh, that kind of are more, I, I'd say, sustainable for the long run for your website in particular. And that could be to say, well, the website, it, the competitor is doing these things badly, and maybe Google is ignoring those, but I can do those things really well. Uh, so that when Google reevaluates my website over time, it'll see, well, actually, I have a lot more things that are lined up and done well. So that's that's definitely one approach. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times these situations are based on kind of technical elements of a website, where if you look at a website and you say, oh, their HTML is not good, or they have maybe this specific score in a testing tool that you have, and your website has a better score, uh, those technical elements do matter to some extent. But what is also really much more important, almost, is the, the overall quality and uh, the value that your website brings to the web. Uh, so that's something where it's, it's very easy as an SEO who focuses on tools and numbers to say, well, technically, my website is better. But practically, maybe that other website is just a lot better in that it's, it provides a lot more value to users. It works really well for those users. So they might be doing things like, I don't know, using frames on the website and doing kind of these old school HTML things that are not really great. But the value that they provide is just so much more than uh, kind of this technically sleek website that maybe you have at the moment. So focusing on kind of the, the areas of improvement where you see you can surpass those competitors is important, but also making sure that you're providing something that is really significantly better than them overall, and not just from a technical level, but kind of just uh, purely from a, a user level as well. And I think evaluating that non-technical aspect is really hard. But one of the things that I find really insightful every time I look at it is uh, when, when you do user studies. So uh, we, we did a blog post specifically, I think, for the core updates and for the, the Panda update at a time with like lots of questions you can ask yourself or you can ask users about your website. And that's the kind of thing that I would take and do a user study and maybe find 10, 20 users of your website and go through these questions in an objective way to really get input on where you can improve your website, not purely from a technical level, but also kind of from, from a user level as well. Um, let me see. Maybe we can run through some of the, the other questions here. Um, the, the large website with millions of products, I think we talked about that briefly. The most important ranking factors, um, I don't think we list the most important ranking factors, so I'll have to disappoint you there. Um, if I submit a blog post today and add more content in 10 days from now, do I need to submit an updated state map for the blog post to get updated? or? Um, will it just get recrawled? Uh, so the 
sitemap file definitely helps us understand when there is new and updated content. So that's, that's a great thing you can do. If this is something that is kind of, if you're using a CMS like WordPress, for example, then this will be completely automated. There's nothing that you need to do there. Uh, if you're using a setup where you don't have a kind of an automatic sitemap file, then you can use the submit to indexing feature in inspect URL and let us know that way. Uh, from a practical point of view, if you're doing anything more than a website with let's say, 10 pages, I would strongly recommend using a sitemap file and automating this rather than doing it manually. Uh, should a 404 page contain a self-canonical? Is it OK if I added one and then removed it? Um, we don't look at any content on a 404 page. So if a page is returning a 404 status code, then essentially we say, OK, that's, that's fine. That's enough for us. Uh, so if there's a canonical there, if there's a no index there, if there's uh, anything else on that page, we essentially ignore that. If it's a 404 page, it's, it's a 404 page. Um, cool. OK. Um, I think we ran through those questions. What else is on your mind? What else can I help with? John, John actually, that question about uh, a date popping up actually remind me of something. A friend of mine uh, asked me a question about our site, and I thought it was a pretty good question because it had well wide appeal for others. And it's, it's about different types of content on one site. Um, so she has a website that has resources for women who are interested in stand-up comedy, where you can take classes, how to write a routine, that kind of stuff. It's very, very evergreen. But she also has a blog that's written by established comedians tied to news events. So she asked me if the Newsier articles uh, written by these well-known comedians or experts, if you will, should they have bylines and timestamps while the evergreen content does not? Um, so yeah. I guess that. I, I think that makes sense, yeah, to, to have something like that. It's, it's sometimes, I imagine, a bit tricky if you mix those two on the same site, and if it's hard for us to recognize which part is the newsier content, which part is the evergreen content. Um, so something like separating that out in a separate URL structure, I think, would make sense. Uh, but uh, in general, if you have something that is timely, then I would certainly go for making sure that you have that byline there, that you have the date on the page, that you have the date in the structured data as well, uh, just so that we can clearly understand this is something new that just came out. Maybe we can show it in Discover. Maybe we can show it otherwise in the search results. Thanks. Hey, John. Hi. Hi. Uh, like, uh, I'm having a question on like a XLO boot tag. So uh, we can't suppose to use like a private uh, folder or uh, uh, the page level uh, no index meta tag. So uh, I just go through the XLO boot tag. So uh, is, is, the, is that the permanent solution for uh, preventing the Google from the index? Or it's like uh, something uh, similar to robot.txt blocking? So we need to block the uh, page entirely, uh, permanently, from the Google or any other search engines. So can we use XRobot tag? Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know about other search engines. So uh, in particular, the, the XRobots tag is kind of a special variation of the robots meta tag. So I don't know if all search engines process that exactly the same way. Uh, but uh, if, if you're serving the xrobots tag on a site-wide level for all of the URLs from your website, then that's, that's a good way to prevent them from being indexed. OK. So like, uh, the server-level configuration or the he header.php, uh, like, uh, which, uh, which method uh, did you prefer for the, the entire site blocking? Totally up to you. Um, OK. That's like we, we only see the end result, and how you implement that end result is, is totally up to you. OK. Thank you. Sure. John, John? OK. Our oh, question uh, actually, uh, there's a website you know, which was uh, put to no index through Meratex and was you know, de indexed uh, 10 days ago. 
when we realized and you know we removed that uh, no index property or tag and we're just waiting for about 10 to 12 days now uh, to get you know crawled by the google but is this something you know take extra long when this happens usually because the average you know uh, we, we get index or sites in a uh, few days like three to four days or maybe seven days but it is taking a bit longer anything you can add to it um it, is it the the whole website or is it just uh pages within the website Actually, I was reviewing. It was the whole website which was put to no index, you know. So the eventually, whole website was uh, removed from the Google. So when we looked and we, we find that you know the whole website is is, is no index that's removed. So we just uh, yeah yeah. And and how long ago did you remove the the no index? Uh, it was about twenty sixth and twenty seventh of December. And now it is eight, so it's quite a long year. Now, so usually, for for the most part, I, I think there are, there are two aspects that play in, into that. On on the one hand, for most most websites, we try to recrawl at least some of the pages every couple of days. Uh, so even if the the website was on no index for a long time, then we should try to recrawl those every couple of days. So it's like end of December, and now that feels like I don't know, maybe two weeks almost. Uh, that seems like a time where we should have recrawled at least some of those pages and shown those again. Uh, so that's something where I. I would say if we're not indexing anything after two weeks, that feels like maybe there might be something else that is wrong. So maybe something like a removal request is still pending somewhere uh, within the website. You can check that in Search Console. Uh, maybe there is a manual action that's in place. You can also check that in Search Console. Um, those are, I, I think, the, the most obvious ones that could be a, a at role there. It could also be that maybe the website is returning a 404 status code when you look at the page. And in a browser, it can look normal, but the status code might be 404. Uh, so that's, that's kind of one thing there. Um, but that's really, I would say, the case if we don't index anything at all from the website after like, those two weeks. Uh, if we index things like the home page, but not all of the detail pages, then I think that's normal after, after two weeks. I think that's something that tends to take a little bit longer, especially if the whole website was on no index for a longer time. So that's something where I'd say, like, if, if we're not indexing anything after two weeks, that feels like something else is wrong. If we're not indexing everything after two weeks, that's completely normal. I would expect that to take maybe several months to, to get picked up completely again. Uh, so those are, I, I think, the, the two aspects there. Yeah. All right, I'll take that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Hey, again. <laughs> Hi. Um, so oh, happy new year, by the way, uh, John and everyone. Uh, so um, I've got one around the Search Console. I've noticed in some cases that uh, certain queries that are very low in average position, you know, 60, 70, 80, have a very, very high uh, number of impressions. Um, I know that, uh, for example, with other products like Google Analytics, Google tries to filter out bots and scrapers and things like that. I wonder if for Search Console, these high number of impressions for such a low position where Users don't wouldn't usually get to like page seven of the search results. Uh, are are you know are either like is, is it just scrapers or bots or anything like that or it might be a, a, a bug or something? Uh, how reliable are are these impressions basically? Um, we we do filtering for kind of scrapers and things like that on on several levels. Um, but it's also something that it's it can happen that it shows up in Search Console. Uh, so that's not completely excluded that we would never show that there. Uh, 
Uh, but for the most part, I think we mo most of these things are filtered before they reach Search Console. So uh, my, my guess is if you're seeing something like that, which is obviously kind of a pattern of kind of scrapers and bots and the, the usual stuff, then that might be kind of a side effect of that, that we're just not filtering in Search Console. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, the weird thing is that, uh, so I'm, I'm comparing two queries. Of, for one of them, the average position is like 10, 11, 12, something like that. The other one, average position is 60 or 70. Uh, both seem to have about the same search volume, give or take. Um, and they both have like you know, 10, 15,000 impressions. So I get why, why the one on page two or page one might have that. But page seven, the same number of impressions, that, that, that has to be something odd there. I don't know. It is really hard to say. So, sometimes the, the ones I've seen that, that have gotten through in, in Search Console are things that are uh, more periodic in that if you look at the, the individual query, then you see, oh, it's like every Sunday they come and it's like thousands of impressions. Uh, that might be a sign that it's in that direction, but it's, it's really hard to say. Some, sometimes these, these things just make it into Search Console. Right. Um, the only problem with that is that uh, if you're trying to check out like uh, click-through rate, for example, to try to figure out, oh, look, these are some queries that have a lot of impressions. We have a very low click-through rate. Let's try to optimize for those or something like that. Uh, yeah. Where the data is not actually there. It's not actual users that are, are doing those, are uh, creating those impressions. Yeah. I, I think that's always a struggle. But I mean, I mean uh, on, the, on the one hand, I'm not not really a fan of people scraping search uh, anyways, but uh, the, these bots and scrapers are around all the time anyway. So it's always, the, regardless of how you're tracking those metrics, you always have this, this level of noise that's, that's involved there, which makes it a little bit tricky to understand are these actual users or are these uh, bots acting like users. Right. OK. Cool. OK. Let me pause the recording here. Uh, it's, it's been great having you all here. And uh, it's, it's been good doing these uh, Hangouts again, kind of something a little bit regular and normal along the way. Um, I'll be around a little bit longer as well. So if any of you want to stick around after the recording stops, you're welcome to stick around. Um, otherwise, uh, I set up the, the next English office hours for next Friday in the, the evening our time here, so maybe a little bit better for the US time zones. Uh, so you don't have to get up in the middle of the night, Michael. Uh, always good to have you here, though. Um, and I think a German one is lined up as well for next week. So if you have anything that we still need to cover, feel free to jump into one of those office hours or, of course, drop by the uh, Search Central help forums uh, where, where experts like Mihai hang out and can help answer your questions as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. And let me pause the recording now.